How many people know about shooters? <laughs> One, two. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. <laughs> How many people have been to shooters? Uh, I didn't know they allowed graduate students in. Only if you ride the ball. I don't think I write the book. Well, there was an article in the in the Duke University student newspaper on shooters recently. Did you see that? Uh, yeah, it was what was it about uh, the thrust of it was uh, uh, social life for students that do is really pretty miserable, but there's always shooters. I think that was the the, the message, if I recall correctly. Okay. Uh, there's an outstanding, oh, look, I shouldn't say an outstanding homework. First of all, thank you all for sending in homework number six, right? And I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, uh, someone, I won't mention the name so you won't throw, uh, throw things at him. Someone reminded me that I had gently suggested that we have another a good homework problem, and that is to dr derive the next term in the series for expanded piston theory, right? And so you all have that article written by two eminent faculty at Duke, and they worked out the first two terms. The first term is classical piston theory. The second term gave us enough new information we could publish a paper, which is what you need to do if you're a faculty member, right? And striving to get ahead. And uh, now we're going to allow you the privilege of getting the next term. And what I would suggest you try doing, I haven't tried doing this, I should have tried to do this. What you ought to do is get all the terms. And you can do that using uh, symbolic algebra, right? You use Mathematica or MATLAB or one of the symbolic algebra pieces of software. My guess is you could do, do all the terms. But you, at a minimum, for this course, I would like you to do the next term. I can see there's a lot of enthusiasm for doing this. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you can publish a note just based on the next term or not, but if you get all the terms, that, that's worth something, right? We'll have one, two, three, four, five. We'll have, I have about 10 authors, and that'd be fantastic. I need another publication. It's been a slow year. I only have three or four so far. You need to, you know, it's important to, keep, important to keep your career advancing. So if you'll work on that, and when shall we make that do? A week from today? A week from today. Why not? A week from today. Okay, now uh, today, well, first of all, any questions? Oh, I should always ask the same question. Are there any questions about anything? Yeah, hearing none, we're now going to spend an, at least one lecture on subsonic three dimensional unstable dynamics. Actually, we're going to spend several lectures because we're going to give you the opportunity to, to use a, an industrial strength. Unstable yeah. dynamics code, right? And uh, so we'll, go, we'll, 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 we'll hear, you'll hear more about that next week. But today we're going to go through the basic theory. And so we'll start by reminding you of an expression we had for three-dimensional supersonic flow. Uh, remember what we did. Um, we had uh, We'll start with 3D supersonic flow and then quickly go to subsonic. From 3D supersonic, as we are wont to do, we have phi, which is a function of x, y, z, and t, right? And we assume that was something that depended on x, y, and z, e to the i omega t, right? Then we took a Laplace transform of phi, call that capital phi, which by definition is the integral from zero to infinity of phi bar e to the minus px dx, right? Then we took a Fourier transform of the Laplace transform of phi, which is the Fourier transform of capital P, which we defined as P star, which by definition is the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of capital P, e to the minus I gamma Y 
P1, right? Where gamma is the Fourier transform variable. And P, of course, is the Laplace transform variable, never, ever to be confused with the perturbation pressure. And when we went through, uh, thank you. When we went through three-dimensional supersonic flow, and we had a boundary condition, right? We had a boundary condition that said d phi, d z, and z equals zero was some known quantity which describes the, the motion of the wing. And we took a, a Laplace, we assumed some harmonic motion, took a Laplace transform with respect to x or this, took a Fourier transform with respect to y, right? do all those things. Then we had the d phi star dz at z equals zero equals capital W star, where this is the Laplace, some part my motion, and then the Laplace Fourier transform of this, and of course this is the same thing as that. The result of all that, then, let's do construct a relationship between phi star and this quantity, um, and more particularly the one uh, when we are on the on the wing, z equals zero in our approximation. So this is was equal to capital W star a over mu squared plus gamma squared square rooted, where this mu was a function of frequency, speed of sound, and Mach number. It was the same function we had in 2D supersonic right? The only thing that happened as a result of 3D in the transform plane was added as gamma squared. Well, now we're going to do even more formal magic. Now I'm going to, rather than taking a Laplace transform with respect to x, because I can't do that in some sign form, right? Since things are not zero for x less than zero. I'll take a Fourier transform with respect to x as well. The good news is in the, in the transform plane, I get the same same quantity, except in subsonic flow, taking a Fourier transform with respect to x simply replaces P, the Laplace transform variable, by I alpha, where alpha is the Fourier transform variable. This is the one with respect to x, and of course gamma is the one with respect to y. Okay, that's easy enough. Of course, it's when we try to invert back from the transform domain to the physical domain that life gets a little more difficult. In particular, if I if I do the sort of thing I did in supersonic flow, I'll end up with an integral relationship between between the inverse of this and the inverse of that. But the integral will be all over the entire plane is equal to zero because the flow is disturbed everywhere, not just on the wing, but everywhere else as well, because it's subsonic flow. And the, uh, the body is traveling at a speed, by definition, that's less than the speed of sound. So all the disturbances are propagating out at a faster velocity than I'm moving, and therefore, eventually, all the flow is disturbed. So the airflow is constantly flying through the surface flow, disturbed because of its own motion. Right? So, the, the thought is, well, we'll invert the relationship. So, we'll put V inside the integral and W outside the integral. In fact, we'll do better than that. We'll, we'll construct an analogous relationship between not V, but between the perturbation pressure P and, and the motion variable, and put P inside the integral because, from our discussion of off-wing boundary conditions, we know the perturbation pressure for lifting flows is zero. Therefore, the integral is not over 
the entire wing. It's only over, excuse me, the entire 7 c zero is only over the, the wing itself. That's key. That, that's the key idea. Okay. So, uh, what do we need to do? In addition to this, we also need the relationship between the Laplace double, uh, the double Laplace Fourier transform of P that comes from Bernoulli's equation, which generates I omega plus U I alpha times capital P star. This is the transform of Bernoulli's equation. So let me give you some names, <coughs> some numbers. That's one, this is two. So using two and one, and of course I want to do this on the wing, so we're on the plane z equals zero. Using this and this, I can get a relationship between this and this. Right? And I prefer to solve for this in terms of p and whatever else is left, and then do the inversion. So when you do that, I just happen to have it right here. When you do that, when you take one and two, you can produce three. And that looks like the following. Uh, I have W star over here. On the other side, there are two minus signs. There's uh, there's a minus sign here, there's another minus sign here, so it ends up being plus. And so we have W star equals mu squared plus gamma squared square rooted times P star divided by rho infinity I omega plus U infinity I alpha. Okay? And these are both at P equals zero. I was, this is all z equals zero, of course. But sometimes I'll forget to say that. So now, now if I invert, I get back to W bar A at some point x, y. It also depends on the frequency, omega, because everything is EI omega t, right? To get the total solution in time, I multiply both sides by EI omega t. And then over here, I'll have a double integral of p bar, a function of c eta, d c d eta, where c and eta are dummy spatial variables in the x and y direction, respectively. And then I'll have something which I'm going to call, well, I'll just write it this way, inverse of Laplace, inverse of this, of everything, everything that multiplies p. P star, right? Except this is usually written in a non-dimensional form, so I'm going to do that before I define this one whole function. So I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this side by u infinity, and I'm going to divide this side by u infinity. Remember, this has w bar sub a has the dimensions of velocity, right? It's, it's the time derivative of the deflection plus u infinity times the slope dw dx is equal. So this is non-dimensional, and hopefully this is non-dimensional too. And if you work it out, it, indeed it is. So W bar sub A, a function of X and Y, over U infinity, is equal to um, P bar of C eta, D C D eta, divided by rho infinity, U infinity squared. Oops. Yeah. Uh, remember, there's a rho infinity from here, and there's U infinity from here, and then I'm going to divide through this expression by U infinity, and that'll give me another U infinity. And this, and then this function, k x minus c y minus eta, by definition. is the inverse um, 
of this thing. U squared plus gamma squared square rooted. I already used up the row infinity, so it doesn't appear anymore. I divide through by U infinity to, to get my U infinity here. So this is I omega over U infinity plus I out. Okay. Now, formally, to do this inversion, what do I have to do? I have to multiply the e to the i alpha x, e to the i gamma y, and integrate over all alpha and gamma. And then there's a 1 over 2 pi squared, right? 1 over 2 pi from each transform when I do the inversion. Okay. I'm not going to bother to write that down formally unless you insist. You, 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 is that okay? Okay. You'll be relieved. In the, I couldn't sign this as a homework problem, but someone became famous after decades of work <laughs> by several people uh, in, in, to obtain this result. And it's really a tricky result for reasons that will become apparent in a moment. But someone has done this. And, it's a, and the expression for it is available in a reliable text. So I'm going to write it down for you. I'm only going to write it down once because it's ugly and complicated, but I want to write it down once to point out some of its essential features, which are sobering. So this function, and I'll just write it in terms of, thank you, I'll just write it in terms of x and y because it, it, I just replaced it x by x minus c and y by x eta, right, when I put it in here. So here, here's the expression. It turns out there's a factor of y squared, which you can take out and separate, and I want to do that. k is a function of x, y is equal to the following. It's minus 1 over 4 pi times M is the Mach number. M X over Y plus R over Y. And you might ask, what's R? I'm going to tell you. R squared is X squared plus beta squared Y squared. And you might ask what beta is. Well, beta squared is 1 minus M squared, which appears several times, right? Um, okay, so it's that divided by R over Y, X over Y squared plus 1 times an exponential whose argument is I omega Y over U, and then we have M over beta squared. And then we have again m x over y minus r over y. And then we have plus an exponential whose argument is minus i omega x over u infinity times the integral from zero, and I'll write the upper limit in the moment, of the exponential i omega z over u infinity over z squared plus 1 3 halves dz. You're still with me, right? <laughs> it's in the book. I don't know. It's probably not worth writing down. And then the, the limit, the upper limit is what? It's x over y minus m r over y times oh, divided by beta squared. Well, that's not so bad. Okay? That's what it is. Now, it simplifies a little bit if you set a make it to zero and deal with steady flow, right? But not much. There's no reason to think this is going to turn out to be sine of something and cosine, or 
Uh, and, and by the way, they're alternative forms, but they're all equally ugly. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, but the thing I really want to point out is the Y squared. <laughs> the right hand side is more or less well behaved if you look at it. That is, you set in various values of X and Y, and things generally are well behaved. But the Y squared is a killer. Because if I want K, I've got to divide through by Y squared. And if Y happens to be zero, that's a heck of a singularity. Remember before we were talking about singularities that went over like y, or equivalently y to the one half. One over y to the one half is an integral singularity. You integrate one over y to the half, you get y to the plus one half, right? And everything's just fine. So it's an integral singularity. This is not an integral. You integrate one over y squared and you get one over y. And when y goes to zero, it's still a big number. Okay. So that's very sober. And uh, you know, they still teach people about Cauchy principal values. I ever take a course where that, that phrase was mentioned. Well, Cauchy became world famous by figuring out how to deal with one over y, not one over y squared, one over y. And so uh, when they teach certain courses of mathematics, the great mathematician Cauchy was honored for figuring out what to do with one over y. There was a guy named Mengler who, uh, probably during World War II or shortly thereafter, he was a German. Who was captured and uh, worked for the Royal Aircraft Establishment after the war, and then published his results. Uh, who figured out how to do this? And what you have to do is it's really a, it's a, it's a paper. What you really have to do is, by the way, this z is just a down here in this integral, wherever it is. Yeah, this z is just a dummy variable. In some ways, it's an unfortunate choice, but that's why I wrote the book. So I'm right here. The real physical z, never to be confused with this dummy variable, right? The physical Z, you know, some things that function X, Y, and Z, we've been blithely saying Z to zero because that's where we're running some solution. It turns out what Mangler finally figured out is what you really have to do is try to do it when Z is not equal to zero, and then take the limit as Z approaches zero, and then you get a finite result and everything works out nicely. Um, so this is a very singular function. What does that mean? Well, it means when I try to do this integral, I, if I'm not careful, I get into great trouble. And so people spent several decades trying to figure that out numerically, how to evaluate that integral. And there were two approaches, and I'll tell you the approach that was first tried, which works after a fashion. And uh, that was, people did that for 10 or 20 years. And then someone else came up with a simpler approach, which is not really based on any rigorous mathematics. That work, and that's the method that people use today. Okay, so let's look at this integral equation. Again, it's w bar over a, a function of x, y, y, b, u, infinity, equals integral of this k function. It's the ugly thing I just wrote down, but now with x replaced by x minus c and y minus eta, and then the perturbation pressure function of c and eta, d c, d eta, and divided by u infinity, rho infinity, u infinity, squared. Um, this is non-dimensional, of course, and so is this. Um, d c, d eta has the dimensions of length squared. So this should have the dimensions of length squared, which it does, or one over length squared, I should say, because the whole thing has to be non-dimensional, right? Because the left hand side is non dimensional, the right hand side has to be ultimately non dimensional too. Uh, okay. But most importantly, this integral now is only over the wing. Over, over the wing only. And we set it up that way because we know the perturbation pressure is zero off the wing. But of course, it's the perturbation pressure we want to know. What we know on the wing is this one. What we don't know and want to know is that thing. So this is an integral equation. It's a singular integral equation because k is so singular, right? And there are entire books and mathematicians who devote their lives to studying single integral equations, which occur in other areas. Uh, for example, you look at the theory of elasticity, there's a single integral equation, but it's stress waves and solids. And but this, uh, this one is particularly nasty. 
we plug K is so so simple. So, but ignoring that for the moment, what might you based on what you've done so far in this course? If I have some function of two special variables, what might I be tempted to try? I'm sorry. Last time I said separation of variables. Yeah, that, that. Well, in a way, in a way that would be okay. It depends on what you mean. What do you mean by separation of variables? <laughs> <laughs> Well, help 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 Kevin out. He he's got to start here. In a way, it's okay last time. <laughs> <laughs> well, what what do we do? What do we do when we have deflection of a plate? Oh, sorry, this is deflection, not to be confused with that, right? What what do we do then when we we try to work out a solution in our last system? Combinational no, it's why not? We we write down M Q M Psi M of C eta, right? Where we artfully choose things. Artfully, carefully, cleverly. Well, that's the first thing people try. Why not just use why not take P and write it as a summation of modes? Uh, I don't know what variable you want to use here. Well, why not this? P sub n, um, yeah. I'll, I'll use this function to distinguish for these kind of functions. Why not? Because if we do that and we put it in here, then these are just constants, right? And so all I really need to do is be able to integrate this function times each of these functions, and I'm done. And then I reduce this integral equation. To, to essentially a series of algebraic equations to determine these coefficients. Now, there's still the open question about how to determine the equations, which in turn determine the coefficients. And you could think of at least two ways to do that, I think. Uh, one way was never tried, to the best of my knowledge, but to me it's sort of the obvious. Now, maybe they should have tried. I wasn't back there when they were doing this, so they didn't ask me. But one thing you could do is you could see uh, if I if I have n equals one to seventeen terms. So that's my favorite number. If I have seventeen terms in the series, and I put this in here and I work out those integrals, I have seventeen unknowns. So I need seventeen equations to determine those seventeen unknowns. So the question then is how do I do, how do I construct seventeen equations? What would Galerkin say? Remember Galerkin? What would Galerkin say? I remember Galerkin. What Galerkin would say is I would multiply this entire equation 17 times each time by one of these functions and integrate it over, over the interval. So what I would do is I would, I, I mean, this is going to call this what? This is equation four, I guess. I could multiply four by psi one. By the way, I want the psi one of phi uh, one of, of x y, then phi two, all the way up to phi seventeen of x y. And so I first integrate this thing, right, with respect to c and eta. And then I multiply by this and integrate with respect to x and y, and then C, eta, x, and y all go away, and I just have 17 algebraic equations and 17 unknown coefficients, and I invert a matrix, and I'm done. Right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, no one ever did this, as far as I know, in the literature. What they did instead, which may have been a bad idea using 2020 hindsight, is what they did is they did the following. They chose 17 values of x and y, 17 points on my way. Pick the 17 you like. And then I write down this equation for each of those points, right? Then I get 17 equations and 17 unknowns, and I can still do an inversion. That's called collocation. 
what this multiplying by these mode shapes is called Galerkin. It's called being called where you collide. So they're two different ways, right? Do you mean literally 17? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you mean literally they chose 17? Oh, they would. Oh, it depends on the problem. Uh, you know, they would might use 17. They certainly would use more than four or five. They probably use maybe eight or ten. When this was first being done, the computers weren't nearly as powerful as they are. How did they choose the number? 17 just seems very oh, arbitrary. Oh, well, I, that's I just I'm just kidding. This is my favorite. What you really do is you try one, you get an answer. Then you try two, you get another answer. Then you try three, you get another answer. And if you're lucky, after you've gone up to Four, five, six. The answer doesn't change much. You say, I'm done. Right? But this is a single integral equation that derives from a non-conservative system, and all the usual theorems about convergence of mobile series and so forth are not applicable. <laughs> so it's a trial and error sort of thing. Okay. Not only that, if you're not careful about how you choose these functions, you get nonsense. Complete nonsense. The series doesn't converge, and even well, get nonsense. The reason is that the solution in subside flow to the wave equation, the original wave equation, is not unique. Okay, there are a lot of solutions that will satisfy the boundary condition and the wave equation. It turns out and this has been known for a long time for Laplace's equation, which is the Mach number equals zero case, and for steady flow. There's a whole rich mathematical literature about that case. So it's not surprising that it's still true when the Mach number is not zero, the frequency is not zero. <laughs> right. And, and those theorems actually don't, the unique theorems don't exist for those cases. But since it didn't work for two-dimensional study incompressible flow, there's no reason to think it's going to work. The solution will be uh, unique for three-dimensional flow and still. Okay. So, so the way aerodynamicists uh, have learned to make the solution unique is that they require that this perturbation pressure drop to zero at the trailing edge. And you say, well, yes, of course, because remember we wanted the, the pressure off the wing to be zero, or we, we concluded it was zero, and that therefore it should be zero at the trailing edge too. But if you use that same logic as I mentioned earlier, you would say the perturbation pr pressure should be zero at the leading edge. According to this theory, if you set the pressure equal to zero at the training edge, the pressure at lean edge is infinite. But it's a weak one over a square root singularity. So we, we accept that. But from a mathematical point of view, you could let the pressure be zero at the leading edge and then let it become infinite at the training edge. Why don't we do that? Because that doesn't agree with the experiment. Okay. And then years later, people looked at the Navier-Stokes equations and within reason, made the mathematical argument why it should drop the zero to the trailing edge rather than lean edge. And the limit as the Reynolds number gets very large, which is when you go from presumably from distance flow to end distance flow. Anyway, but back in this day, they didn't know all that yet. And so they just uh, uh, set uh, the perturbation pressure to zero to the trailing edge. And that was done by Kutta and Joukowsky, right? And so there are two names associated with this assumption. And there you are. Okay. Uh, but now there's some practical problems. Now let me draw a picture with this method. If I have a uh, wing like this, uh, like this, and then I'm also often interested in a control surface like this, right? It rotates. I've already mentioned that we want to set the uh, perturbation pressure equal to zero at the trailing edge, right? Uh, and we're going to accept that the pressure goes to infinity weakly, but goes to infinity at the leading edge. But then if you look at a discontinuity and slope of a wing, it turns out the pressure weakly goes to infinity at this hinge point too. And so when I construct these these wonderful functions, I have to build that into my assumption. Okay? And now I have, if I have a real wing, I have to look at it down on top of a wing. I have a real wing. It looks like this. And now I have a, a partial 
control service over here, and maybe I have four or five of them. <laughs> then I've got all those singularities, and I've got to start constructing a whole family of functions that have, it gets out of hand, right? It gets out of hand. So it's hard to choose functions. I mean, this method in principle does work if you can choose a good set of functions, but choosing the functions is, is hard. So people knew that, but they were struggling along. And then uh, there's a guy named Bill Rodden. He just passed away last year. Uh, and Bill was an interesting guy. He had a PhD from UCLA. He did it with John Miles, who was a famous aerodynamicist and probably mathematician today. And uh, Bill's comment about John Miles was, I never really understood any of his papers, but he was a terrific mentor. So, and, and I can understand that if you ever tried to read one of Miles' papers. Anyway, Bill uh, was a practical engineer, but he decided in the late stage to get a PhD. And he was looking for a PhD topic. And he was in industry. He was doing his PhD part time. And so he had an idea. And his story was he tried to convince the Air Force for years to fund him, and they wouldn't. So he did it in his spare time. And he said, let's do the, let's forget about all this stuff. Let's do the following. Uh, let's take this equation four. I'll write it down one more time. And do the following. He said, look, the what, reason we get in trouble is because this k function is really nasty. Remember when y is equal to zero, or in this case, it's when y equals eta, right? It's when y equals eta. When this y and this eta coincide, as inevitably they will, right? Since they both cover the same physical space. When they're, they, you know, that k gets really bad. So my, my method, whatever it is, I'm never going to let y and eta be the same. Never gonna let that happen. So I'm gonna choose I'm gonna divide this this wonderful wing into boxes. I mean that works in super science well, right? So we have lots of boxes. So I have lots of boxes, right? And in each box, why the one associated with with the motion of the wing, y is going to be at the magic three quarter point. Right? Three quarters going to, yeah, three quarter cord of the box. And eta, oh, two, not y, x. And uh, c is going to be at the one quarter cord. Of the box. So they're, they're never going to ma match. And uh, and I'll choose the Y's so that they don't match either. Y and eta do not match either. And I'll see what happens. He got a good answer. Not in every case. Actually, there's some pathological cases, but mostly he got good answers. And then later on, some Russians proved that in 2D flow, where there's, you still have some singularities, although they're not as not as strong, in 2D flow, they proved that for 2D incompressible study flow, that if you use this magical placement, you get the exact answer, and and there's a rigorous foundation. For that. Okay. So this is called the double lattice method. This, there's more to the story than what I've just told you, but this is the heart of the story. The double alliance method, and this is mainly what is built into most commercial codes, including NASPAN and Zona and other things that people use today. Um, and people still fiddle with this. I mean, uh, there, there's still occasionally someone writing a paper on a better way to evaluate the K function that turns out. Remember, there's an integral in the k function, so you have to decide how you're going to evaluate that integral. You have to evaluate that numerically. That gets mathematically or computationally tedious. Um, but nevertheless, 
This is what this is what it's done. But but this uh, the subsonic case is transonic is even more difficult. But the subsonic case is much more sensitive and much more difficult than the supersonic case. But it worked. And uh, next week uh, next week you're gonna have the opportunity to uh, to discuss how one of these codes works and how that run it maybe and get an answer. You derived the from the pen. Yeah, yeah. Well we we probably but but there, if you look at the book, there's a footnote to uh, the papers by Rodman. Actually, it's Rodman Al Albano, who's one of his colleagues. Um, and <laughs> another story is that Zona actually has a slightly different method. That's a, I, we're actually going to use the Zona code. Yep. The Zona code came later. Zona is the name of a company out of Scottsdale, Arizona. And the president is a guy named P.C. Chen, and uh, PC has his own version of, of all this. And so uh, when Bill Rodden was still alive, he would go to these meetings of the people from the Aerospace Institute, and there would be a, usually a vigorous discussion between Bill Rodden and, and PC about the, the relative virtues of their approaches. And, and they would go, well, my method gives the following answer to four significant. No one cares about four significant, but, but they care. And, and your, your method is often the fourth decimal place. I'll say my method is superior. Or my method will do a reduced frequency, reduced frequency meaning omega C over U. It will do the, do the solution at a, at a reduced frequency of 10. Well, no one cares about 10. I mean, all the reduced frequency of interest are less than one. But, you know, they would have this great debate. It was fun to watch. <laughs> I, I think it was all done mostly in good humor. I think. Anyway. Okay. Uh, I think that's all I want to tell you about subsonic flow in terms of foundations. Questions? Yes. Is that the same thing you see in solid Tell me that one more time. I've seen a few solutions. Oh, that's something entirely different. Yeah. Uh, when people talk about CFD code, they're usually talking about solving, not always, they're usually talking about solving the nonlinear potential flow equation, or more commonly now, the Euler equation or the Navier 6 equation. Okay? Uh, these methods are usually called the panel methods because they think of these boxes as panels, or sometimes it's called aerodynamic influence coefficient methods because you can think of this kernel as a, as a Green's function, an influence coefficient. The k omega and k epsilon relate to a turbulence, empirical turbulence model is built into a Navier flux flow. Okay, so they're, they're, those models are trying to model turbulence, and there's no there's no viscosity in any of these models. Okay. Now there are codes out there. In fact, Zona has one where they marry their panel method, their potential flow method, to uh, an approximation to the boundary layer, which includes viscosity to some degree. Uh, there's a Boundary layer theory is a whole subject in and of itself, but uh, there are so-called integral equations of boundary layers that go back to von Karman and at least 50 years ago, if not 75 years ago. And those are still used by people who do panel methods because it's a it's a cheap way to try to include the effect of viscosity. Whether the answer is accurate or not, who knows? But usually they compare to some other case and oh, it agrees. Of course, they don't tell you about all the other cases they tried where it didn't agree, right? But, yeah. uh, uh, but even even a RANS code, even a Navier-Stokes code, the typical Navier-Stokes code has a lot of empiricism in it. So you don't know if the answer is right or not. Except again, they compare it to something. Say, see, use the experiment. But they don't tell you about the other cases they tried where it didn't agree. But it would be actually far more interesting. Um, so there's still a lot of work to do in unfair damage. Uh, and so uh, the first thing beyond what we, we're doing linear potential flow theory here, right? Uh, the next thing people did was nonlinear potential flow theory, and we're going to discuss that a little bit when we get into transonic flow. There's a nonlinear potential flow theory. Uh, not used much today, although there was a time when that was about the only thing you do with then existing uh, computer resources. And it was a lot 
more exciting and fascinating, whatever, than linear theory, or so people thought. Um, and the, those codes still exist, but they're probably not used much anymore because I think it's fairly clear that, that if you really want to get a better answer, you can, unfortunately, beyond linear potential flow theory, you really need to bring in the studies. Nonlinear potential flow theory at best gives you a qualitative answer, and the other equations are probably not much better than the potential flow theory. So you really have to go to the manuscript. And then there are people who say, oh, but you can't use RANS, which is the manuscript with these turbulence models. Oh, no, that won't give the right answer. You really need, need to use large eddy simulation. But it, it is empirical, too, if you really look at it. So the whole question about solving viscous flows starting from the manuscript equation is still a wide open subject. But there are a lot of codes out there and a lot of people working on that. Mostly they're trying to produce a bigger answer, a bigger a, a bigger grid, but, but the fundamentals are still, in my mind, in question. Having said that, we're working on them too, right? We use those codes also, because that's all we have. It may not be the hammer you want, but it's the hammer you got. Other questions? Well, thank you very much.